Uh, so hello, my name is Brian Wall. Um, I am an urban and, and community forester with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And basically that means I work with communities, nonprofit and industry in Wisconsin to help them manage the urban forest. And we do that through things like technical assistance, grants and education. Um, and today I'm supposed to talk all about urban, for, urban and community forestry, um, but uh, I don't have that much time. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, and I did provide the library with a list of resources um, for a little bit more detail. Uh, so either feel free to reach out to them or myself, and we will send you a copy of those links uh, just so you can get more information on certain topics. Um, and then real quick too, since uh, most of our viewers are gonna be watching this recorded, um, I just wanna let you know what we're gonna cover today. And um, basically what I'm gonna tell you about is what is urban forestry? Uh, what is the urban forest? And uh, after that, we're gonna kind of get into sort of common things that people, homeowners, um, deal with with trees, like things that we tend to do that harm trees and things that we can do to help our trees. Um, and so probably about halfway through, that's where we're gonna start um, that portion. And if you're interested in careers in urban forestry at all, the very last little bit, um, we'll talk about uh, how you can get involved in urban forestry if that's something you're interested in. All right, so without further ado, uh, let's move on to my next slide here. All right, so urban forest. So what is the urban forest? And technically speaking, the urban forest is an ecosystem, ecosystem containing all of the trees, plants, and associated animals in the urban environment. This both in and around communities. And when I say communities, I mean municipalities, including towns, villages, and cities. Um, and this would include park trees, natural areas, and municipalities, but it also includes the trees along our streets, in our downtowns, our parking lots, and our yards. Urban forests, urban forests form the green infrastructure on which our communities depend. When some people will hear the word urban though, they tend to tune out. Like maybe urban doesn't quite apply to where they live. Um, but really urban forestry to me is anywhere that you have trees, infrastructures like buildings and people that are all interacting, simple as that. So urban forests are in Evansville, they're in Edgerton and Milton too. It's the forest outside your door. Did you know that the US has over 140 million acres of, forest can of urban forest canopy? I'm sorry, yeah. Um, and that's according to the technical definition. In Wisconsin though, we're right around 2.5 million acres. That's about 42 million urban trees. Hmm. A lot of people have never thought that the trees outside are or anything but landscaping, but they are forests. Um, interestingly enough, the public sector, um, mainly local municipal governments control only about 15 to 20% of those forests. An average of 80 to 85% of this urban canopy is directly controlled by you and the choices that you make. That means 30 plus million trees are in your care. With over 80% of the US population now living, living in urban environments, the benefits that we get from our urban forests um, are more important than ever. And just real quick on my slide here, you can just see sort of some of the different iterations of what urban forests look like. You know, we have like the beautiful downtown area with the sidewalk and the trees that are providing shade for the businesses. Uh, we have beautiful park settings, a lovely aerial view from Fond du Lac, um, just kind of showing how many trees are actually out there in our urban environment. Of course, a single tree planted in our front yard, and then other beautifully canopied parking lots and roads, um, which are all, again, part of our urban forest. And I gotta find a way, there we go. So what is urban forestry? Well, that's the practical application of arboriculture or tree care. Those are things like pruning, planting, um, insecticide treatments, uh, removal, and, and other things. And these, and, and applying or the practical application of these of tree care, using it to manage a population of trees in our cities, towns, and villages. The scale, well, that totally depends. It could be a whole city, it could be just a park, and yep, it could be your yard or even the street in front of your house. The goals of urban forestry can vary, but ultimately we're trying to maximize the benefits that trees can give us while reducing risk and keeping costs in line. Unfortunately, we can't just plant trees and hope things will be okay. Our forests and the trees in our property need to be managed. And to some degree, this looks remarkably similar to traditional forest management. 
Um, and so what I'm going to do here, just because for some people it helps them to sort of see the comparison between traditional forestry and urban forestry, just kind of how we do that. Um, and so let me, oh, I, and I'm just totally ignoring my picture up here. Um, but if you look at my, the slides here, this is showing some urban forestry in action, of course. Now, again, we have the urban urban picture where we have skyscrapers and trees along the streets, but we also have small residential areas where we're, we're planting trees. And you'll even notice this one's from Wisconsin, right? We have a barn infrastructure, a building, and I can just presume that people work at this farm or live there, and there are trees there as well. So that can be urban forestry, because again, what did I tell you? It's people, buildings, and trees interacting that, to me, make it urban forestry. All right, so again, comparing, my, comparing urban forestry to traditional forestry, well, we both do tree plantings. We're both trying to increase tree canopy. And in traditional forestry, they tend to do it with uh, seedlings, very tiny, tiny, tiny little trees. Um, and they either can plant them by hand or with the mechanical planters that you see there. In urban forestry, we plant much bigger stock. If, imagine if, um, say in Milton, if uh, the street department were to plant seedlings, I mean, we would mow those over. I mean, that's just yeah. sort of ridiculous. So of course we're gonna be planting larger trees, larger stock. And that's a couple of reasons, right? We don't wanna mow them over, but we also like the canopy and quicker canopy and better survival rates when we plant bigger trees. Um, and you can see from our, picture here. We've got a bare root tree on the bottom. We've got a ball and burlap um, up there with a piece of equipment. And then we have the containerized tree, with, which most homeowners are familiar with, um, with the gentleman standing in the nursery there. All right. Now, what else do we have in common? Well, we do, you know, traditional forestry does harvest. We do removals. Because in the urban forest, really, the first thing we want to do, again, is to provide those benefits. But trees do have to come down for various reasons. And when we do that, we're going to have to remove them. And there are various methods to use. Some people are very shocked to find out that, um, as you can kind of see in the, uh, I think that's the, the left-hand picture for you guys, um, it's sort of an orange grapple around a tree by a house there. They're surprised to find out that that same equipment, or that equipment is actually used in the urban environment as well. If you can see over there on the top right, there is a prentice loader, or not a prentice loader, but a, um, a Ponzi. Uh, and that, you know, that's what we see a lot of traditional harvesting uh, now. And of course, we still do have loggers. Um, and in urban forestry, we have folks who are climbing trees to help um, remove trees. We also use cranes these days, which is kind of crazy. But when you can't get to your backyard, you can put a crane over it and cut the tree down and hoist it right over your building. Um, but again, we have harvest and we have removals. And one thing that I do want to mention too is that, again, while we're not planting trees in the urban environment with sort of an end product or wood product um, in mind, uh, there is an urban wood movement which is gaining some steam. And basically what this is, we're trying to develop markets or urban wood is trying to develop markets um, to help communities deal with the wood waste or wood residue that they're producing in more productive ways. You know, keeping it out of the landfill and making it into something beautiful. And as Angie pointed out, I've got this wonderful slab here behind me, <laughs> making it into something beautiful like a, a tabletop or a bench or, you know, whatever else. And now it's going to fall over and crush me. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, urban wood. Again, we're not planting those trees with harvest in mind, but why not use that wood if we can? Um, in some cases, it can really help, you know, offset some of the waste costs. And in other cases, it's really hard because there's transportation involved to get that wood to a mill. And that can really um, uh, end up costing a community uh, rather than saving them money. So, you know, we're working on it. These are some of the issues in urban forestry currently. All right, some other things. Wildlife, right? Traditional forestry has to deal with wildlife because they're eating all of the seedlings and, you know, causing damage out there. Um, but we're, you know, and they're also managing wildlife for benefits. You know, in traditional forestry, they may be looking at, hey, you said you want more deer on your property. Well, here are some things that we can do to increase the deer population. Or you like migratory birds. Great. Here are some things we can do to help with that. Um, so we do some, some similar things, right? So we're managing for wildlife benefits as well. You know, when we plant these trees, they can be pollen sources for bees, nesting sites for birds. Um, but we also have to damage, or I'm sorry, we also have to manage for and mitigate wildlife damage as well. Um, you've probably all seen damage from squirrels in your trees, whether they tend to be dropping leaves at this time of year because they're chewing off buds or whatever, or eating bark, um, but also deer. And a lot of people think deer are not an urban issue for wildlife, but they certainly are. And you can see in this one picture here, I've circled in, in these red ovals, um, 
a brand new line of trees that was planted and you know how much trees are. I mean, these could have been, you know, a $300 tree at the nursery and then they contracted it out. And so it was almost a thousand dollars to plant each tree or something like that. And a deer went down the line and buck rubbed each, sure. every one of them. Yeah. That can be a problem. So we need to manage for these kind of things. Um, but it's not just deer, you know, there's voles and moles and sap suckers um, and even dogs can cause trouble. All right, so some other things that are out there. Um, in traditional forestry, you know, they need to deal with insects, disease, and invasive species. Well, well guess what? You've heard of emerald ash borer. We have to deal with all those same things too. It might be on a little bit of a different scale, but you can see here, they're treating individual trees, um, you know, in a, in a seedling planting, you know, we treat individual, individual large trees. And it comes to surprise to some people too that, you know, aerial spraying can be done over communities. Uh, that was done quite a bit with gypsy moth um, and still is on the, on the very western side of our state um, with the stop the spread for gypsy moth. Um, so yeah, just we are all in the same battle. We are just kind of in a different setting. Um, Brian, can I um, interrupt? And uh, yeah, can I, you bet. About the uh, spraying, is it, mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's pretty safe for people like the spray that they're doing. Yeah, you know, right. And they also, if, 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 if a spray is going to happen um, and somebody is on the uh, list to be notified if in, you know, insecticide is going to be used in their area, um, they need to be notified as well. And so they should get something because there are people who have you know, respiratory issues or whatever that even though the insecticide itself isn't going to be causing them a direct problem, sure. you know, they don't want to be dealing with that. So they can be notified. But yeah, um, the only one that I know that's done aerial spray here in Wisconsin typically is, is BT which is a uh, bacteria, uh, I'm gonna totally mess it up, um, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a fung, oh, yep, see, I don't even know now, it's, it's a fungus or a bacteria, uh, I'm on the spot, um, okay. that, you know, only, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively targeted. So if, you know, it, it's stuff that's naturally in our environment anyway, they just, you know, amp it up a little bit so that it can get out there. Sure. But yeah, they're not gonna be spraying anything like DDT anymore <laughs> sure. um, that are, um, little sketch okay but um also dadcap puts out like hey you know we're going to be doing spraying so if you do have any concerns or questions you can contact them directly okay um Thanks. yeah okay so other other yeah no no problem so other tools that we use um in traditional forestry you can see they do aerial aerial imageries and overlays um to to figure out you know canopy coverage and canopy types and you know maybe how many acres are in pine or how many you know they can do that from aerial photography um, and then they, then they can ground truth it by walking there in person. Um, and in urban, we can do the same thing. We can use the air. This is a picture actually of Hilldale Mall area um, in Madison. And, you know, we get an aerial overlay and then we, it's been did, we can digitize it or there's programs that digitize it and tell us where the canopy is or where like grass is. So it's not actually trees, but it's, it's green stuff, just not, you know, it's green stuff versus cement stuff. So that's what we have there, the canopy, the pervious and impervious. And that can help us figure out how to manage, um, you know, gives us a better picture of what we have out there um, to help us manage. Um, and then a big one are inventories. And even Milton has a tree inventory. Um, mm -hmm. There's, I think is, you, you know, getting a little bit out of date at this point because, you know, once you collect the data, unless you're updating it constantly, I mean, as soon as you collect it, it's kind of out of date because trees are always growing. Um, but we do have this, uh, I mean, Inventories are really important for communities and we use it as a basis for good management because you need to know what you have to be able to manage it well. Just like in your yard, you need to know what you have or how do you know how to, how to handle it? How do you know what diseases it might have or how do you know even where to start? Um, and within the last five years or so, every community that we've helped fund uh, an inventory through our grant program um, is represented in our Wisconsin community tree map. And we have almost well, it's probably like 850,000, but I'll just say almost a million trees represented. And that gives us, as, as managing the urban forest on a state level, you know, it gives us a finer scale to know what's out there and what communities have and what some of their issues might be. Um, and it helps us to set and make policies statewide. But on a community level basis, this is Phillips, for example, this is a small community up in Northern Wisconsin. Um, it helps them make decisions as well. And one of the big things and the main reason I put this one up here is species diversity. Um, you can kind of, I'm hoping you can see this, but mm -hmm. this breaks down and it tells us what, what the species are out there. And 
this can really help us in a community or it can help a community manage its force because we do have some guidelines and it's what we call the 5, 10, 15 rule. So we don't wanna have any more than 5% of one species, no more than 10% of a genus and no more than 15% of a family. And we do that, it used to be broader. We've actually narrowed it down because of Emerald Ash Borer, right? Emerald Ash Borer was, uh, it, most of our communities have about 20% ash. Um, and so, you know, that's pretty devastating, one in every five trees. Um, but you can see here already, um, and this is the one I like to point out to folks is that, so ash here is actually 15%, and that's just green. They probably have white ash too, it's just not showing up. Um, but the maples to me are, are very telling. We've got, 10% uh, in red maple, we've got 8% in silver maple, and then we have another 4% in sugar maple, and I'm sure we have other maples as well. And this is telling. So when people ask me, what kind of tree should I plant? Um, you know, it's not that I don't like maples. I do love maples. We just have an overabundance right now. And I also hope that people just don't stop planting maples, period, because then eventually we won't have any maples. Sure. But in our communities across Wisconsin, and this is just of the publicly owned trees that, that we know of that have been inventory, we're sitting at about 40% maple. Oh. That's double of what we have for ash. So imagine if something comes along, how devastating that could be. Now that's just publicly owned trees. If you've looked around your neighborhood lately, I can tell you that, and I'm just estimating, I'm guessing here based on you know my feel for what I see in people's yards in my yard and in my neighborhood, um, that we're probably sitting at closer to 70% maples in most communities. And again, if something comes here that's going to eat our maple trees, that's going to be pretty devastating. And if you're saying, well, is there anything on the horizon? Unfortunately, yes. The Asian oh. longhorn beetle, it was actually in the Chicagoland area. They did, they did eradicate it there, but it has cropped up and it's doing some business over in Ohio now. Um, so hopefully we can keep that guy out of here forever, but you just never know. And we don't know. There's probably something not, on, not even on our radar that'll show up from who knows where. Um, it's just, you know, that's global trade and urban forestry. Sure. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of maples. So look around. If you want to plant something, look around, see what no one else has and plant that. <laughs> and Be unique, Brian, right? Is, is this community yeah. tree map, like, can anyone see this or is this just specific to you? Yes. Is it like a public access? No, thing? everyone, it, you bet. And I mean, the, the little URL is up there uh, on the mm -hmm. screen, but you can't click on it. Um, however, the, the resources I gave you are there or, you know, just Google Wisconsin Community Tree Map and okay. you should be able to navigate to it pretty quickly. Cool. But yeah, you can look at them all and then you just click on the little dots there too and it'll tell you, you know, this is an ash tree and it's 15 inches in diameter nice. or whatever. So fun stuff. Yeah. Um, and just a couple of the tools that I threw in here for homeowners if they're interested, um, because, you know, you guys probably aren't going to be using Wisconsin Community Tree Map to manage your trees. But uh, this tool here that I just popped up, this is called iTree Design. Again, so iTree puts out a lot of tools. It's an urban, uh, urban forest. It's a US Forest Service partnership with uh, a lot of other folks, uh, mainly Davy Tree Company out of Ohio. But this one's called iTree Design. And you, this one happens to be of a daycare because I was doing a presentation to schools. Um, but you can do this with your own home. In fact, it was designed to do with your own home to optimize where to plant trees in your yard to save you the most money. Uh, energy wise. Um, and it also can tell you, you can grow the tree over 40 years and it can tell you the benefits that it'll provide to you. Uh, some of the benefits that it'll provide to you over the time. And then another tool, this one, and I would just covered up his face, Dan Buckler did a lot of effort here to put together an urban tree key. We actually made this for schools, but we're finding that a lot of the public are really enjoying it as well. Because um, this can help you identify what's out in your neighborhood. And then, you know, you can plant something else. Or if there was only one of them, hey, plant another one, you know, so. Um, kind of fun that way. All right, moving on. So I talked about a lot of the similarities between us and traditional forestry, but I do want to touch on a couple of the differences that are out there. And the biggest one is soil. Because if you are, if you, even if you haven't ever, if you've never taken a soils class, um, but you know, you've, you've, there, you know, there's little, there's books out there that identify the kinds of soils that we have out there, like an Algoma loam or something like that. Um, there is no urban soil. It's just not a listing there. There's no native urban soil. Um, and you've probably watched developments around, I don't know if Middleton's, or, I'm sorry, I don't know if Milton is expanding um, its borders. 
Um, I know Middleton is, that's why I said it. Um, but a lot of urban development, if you ever watch them do that, the first thing they come in and do is they take all the soil that was there and they scrape it right off. They go all the way down to subsoil, you know, they compact it and then they, you know, shred it up, shred the topsoil up or whatever, and they come back with six or eight inches. You know, it's it's really, it's it's very, they've basically destroyed the soil structure. Um, and so managing and getting trees to grow in this area um, for long-term health is very difficult can be very difficult, it's a challenge. So soil is a huge one. No traditional forester has to deal with that much damage to their soil. Even though they do have big equipment out there sometimes, even that, that harvester that you saw earlier, the tires are specifically designed to have less compaction on the soil than human feet, apparently. Hmm. I heard, I don't know if it's true, but wow, right? So they're not, there's definitely not dealing with massive soil changes like we are in the urban environment. The other thing is scale. Um, on a wood lot, you might on a wood lot you might pay a buck or two for a seedling, um, and plant thousands of those in a day. However, in your community or in your yard, you know you're probably going to spend several hundred on one tree rather than you know a buck or two. Um, and in, in the case of your community, it's going to take them you know several days and probably thousands of dollars to plant ten or fifteen, maybe twenty five trees. So the scale is a lot different. Um, the other thing too is we implement our management plans in the urban forest. Um, typically by applying or doing single tree treatments or, you know, on a much smaller scale, especially when we're talking about the trees in your yard. For example, you would never see anyone place lightning protection on a specimen tree in a forest. However, in our urban environment, people do install lightning protection on certain specimen trees. So um, this, you know, again, back to single tree management. Um, and then the other thing is, is, is value. Um, for example, if somebody were to illegally cut a tree in, in somebody else's woodlot, um, they would be responsible probably for trespassing and then what they call trouble damages. And a lot of times, you know, wood in a forest, like one tree, really economically isn't worth a ton. Like you move it to 20 bucks, 40 bucks, you know, maybe $100 for a trunk, you know, and a pretty su substantial one. Um, however, if you were to cut down a tree in your neighbor's yard, that could be costing you thousands of dollars because we value those trees a lot differently. Sure. All right. And we value them a lot differently because of the benefits that they can provide us. And so real quick, I could talk about benefits all day, um, but this is, this is sort of the crux of it. This is why it's so important that we can manage our urban forests, why we can preserve those trees while we're trying to grow the biggest canopies we can. Because the urban forest offers us countless social, economic, and environmental benefits. And I'm sure you're familiar with many. Um, but here's a couple of facts for you, right? So trees in the immediate surrounding areas for Wisconsin urban communities provide an annual energy savings to, again, Wisconsin residents of $79 million. They remove about $47 million worth of air pollution, and they can store, they store somewhere around $500 million worth of carbon. So, I mean, those are huge numbers, um, but trees, you know, they, they're our original green infrastructure and, and they are the only municipal asset that appreciates in value over time. The bigger they get, the more valuable they become, the more benefits they provide. Let's see a fire truck do that. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so trees, trees are a solid investment. For every dollar that we spend on a tree, this is, you know, any, any kind of planting, maintenance, et cetera, throughout its life, we, get a, we can get up to $3 in benefits back. $3 in benefits such as property value increasing, energy savings, pollution, stormwater mitigation, and, and others that we um, sort of alluded to or talked about already. And I'm just trying to, uh, yeah, sorry, I was afraid that was gonna happen. Um, but those things don't even include trees and their health benefits. And a lot of us have figured out this year that being able to get out into nature and enjoy trees, go to a park, um, extremely important during COVID, but it's extremely important, important all the time. And there's a ton of research coming out for health benefits. It's, it's unbelievable uh, just how much is coming out these days, but reduction in stress and anxiety, lower blood pressure, reduced chronic heart disease, faster recovery times from surgery, reduced needs for pain meds, fewer sick days, increased birth weight, et cetera. And all these added together are offering us more than $11 billion in avoided healthcare 
nationwide. So, I mean, incredible benefits. And then I, I can't be remiss. I just want to uh, point out the one here, uh, the trees mean business. You know, research has been done. You know, when we have our downtowns with beautiful trees to provide shade, people drive further because they want to go to those cute, quaint communities. They spend much more time there and they are willing to spend more money there. Even for the same product they can get off Amazon, they're willing to spend 12% percent more in a com community business if it's well treated. Hmm. Crazy stuff, but it's out there. Um, and again, there's that resource list I sent you. If people are interested in digging a little more into that research that's out there and where this all came from, um, there are um, links out there. But the big one out there, really right here at the bottom, if anyone wants to take notes, Green Cities, Good Health. Um, that's out of the University of uh, Washington. And um, they just, they compile a ton of all of the health information out there. So that's a great place to go for that. And then real quick, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the benefits to our kids and our communities. Um, and just if, if we have, because we're losing a lot of ash trees around schools, I, I, I'm seeing it all over Wisconsin. Um, I'm really hoping these schools will replant their trees. And here is why. We see improved outcomes in science and math and language art, better grades, higher test scores, um, students uh, are better able to concentrate uh, and their, their behavior is better when they have green schoolyards, trees to look at. I mean, it, it's phenomenal. Um, and higher graduation, rate, yeah, graduation rates and a higher percent of kids attending four year colleges. Um, so it's pretty amazing. And, and really quick right over here, you know, trees pay us back. This particular tree, it, um, it says thirteen thousand two hundred ninety-eight um, dollars. Well, that's not—that's over its lifetime. It's not every year, but that they just accumulate. You know, that what they did is in this project here, they um, accounted for the benefits that they could, um, and that didn't include all these health health um, ones as well, but just the, sort of the social, and environmental, and economic ones. Um, and over the lifetime of of that tree, the average lifetime of that tree of that size. Um, that's what that tree is providing back to the community. So that's kind of a cool project. So if somebody wants to take up a community project, if there's a Boy Scout out there who needs an Eagle Scout project, that would be a cool one. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, sometimes I do feel drained. Yeah. Um, this is just me to take a little break. If this was a live audience or there are more people online, opportunity to ask questions because I am going to change gears here and we get a little bit more like into the technical stuff like stuff you can do or issues that we have in our yards with our yard trees um, and this won't be diagnosing you know specific diseases or anything but it's going to talk about some of the behaviors that we do or don't do um, which uh, affect the life of our trees so real quick there's a question up here and it says how long does the average downtown tree live well Angie since you're there, you have to answer it. Oh, I have to answer What's your guess? Oh. Uh, yeah, the average downtown tree. How about 30 years? <laughs> Ooh, I love your optimism. The average downtown tree lives only about seven years. Oh, I um, As we move out. But we you know we're talking, these are like serious, like this is like downtown Madison. This is the serious urban downtown tree. As we move out to the suburb, um, in the trees in our yard, we're looking at an average of about 30 years. So you were okay. right there. But okay. 30 years still isn't all that great. No, I mean, that is not. an average, but it's still not that great. I mean, if, especially when you're looking at traditional forestry and, you know, trees can live hundreds of years. So what is it? What's the problem? And this is where I'm going to bring us into our top 10 list of tree killers and tree myths. But I'll give you a hint. In fact, I'll give you the answer. The reason trees struggle in the urban environment is us, <laughs> sure. plain and simple. We're our, our own, or we're our tree's own worst enemy, usually. And sometimes, because we just don't know, and that's okay. Hopefully we can learn something today. So I don't have time for 10, so we're gonna do five. Um, in fact, I noticed the time here, and we are yep. running out of time, aren't we? <laughs> so I'll try to go quick here. All right, so the first one is bark damage. This one is really common, and you're like, oh, well, this doesn't even make sense to me. Well. Do any of these pictures look familiar to you? Especially the one with the uh, the gate. It looks like something was gnawing at that gate. What would gnaw at a gate? You know, what would gnaw at these trees? Well, nothing's gnawing at them. These are mowers and weed whacker damage. Mm. And this happens all the time. You know, there's that pesky grass I couldn't get with my mower. So if I just got a little bit closer, oops, I hit the tree. When you do that, you hit the bark. You can damage the bark as these pictures show, or you go over the roots and you chop off some 
some of the bark off the roots. You know, big deal, right? Well, it is a big deal because right as part of that bark, there is a very, very thin layer, and that's the circulatory system essentially of the tree. That's where all the nutrients and water are going. And when you do this, you damage the circulatory system. How much damage can a circulatory system take before that tree doesn't do so hot? Um, and yes, can it start to grow back and, and sort of, it doesn't really heal itself, it seals over that. It can, but typically if we've bumped it once, we'll bump it twice and weed whackers, Weed whackers are notorious. And a lot of times you don't see the damage from the weed whacker because you're just, you're, you're hitting it, but you are damaging and bruising and breaking vessels within the trunk. So get those weed whackers away from your tree. And so how, how can we deal with that? Well, we can do guards like this. Um, they work, but they're not the best. There's actually an easier one that has a lot more benefits and that's mulch, but don't mulch like that. That's volcano mulching. Get that mulch away from the trunk of your tree. You want something like this. Uh, hopefully you can see it, but there's zero inches right around the trunk itself. And then we move out to about two inches in depth and then out to four. Here is a crazy cool fact for you. Underneath grass versus underneath mulch, or I should say underneath mulch, we have 400 times more fine root growth than you do under turf grass. It is great for your trees to mulch. It protects the roots. It protects the trunk from your weed whacker. It also keeps the competition from um, uh, grass, weeds, dandelions, anything else that's out there. Plus it can insulate the roots. Um, it helps or rather regulates their temperature. So in summer, it can keep the roots cooler, which promotes growth. And in winter, it keeps them warmer. So mulch is awesome. The other thing is it can incorporate some really great organic matter in our urban environments. That is super key when we talk about those crummy soils. So mulch away. All right, uh, number four is improper pruning, okay? What I don't wanna do here is scare you away from pruning. What I do wanna do though is stop you from doing things like this. Um, and, and what we're looking here for examples of that's the big picture there, that's topping. Um, a lot of people used to do that around where I lived in central Wisconsin. They thought it made their trees safer because they can make them smaller, but really you are setting your tree up for a lot of rot, a lot of failure, and a lot of rapid growth, which you know is very weak, um, and they can break out in storms. So that is about the worst thing you can do to a tree. Uh, up top here, we got a flush cut. Um, here we have some tear outs. And then the picture down in the middle with, uh, we call that um, a V branch angle, that's the pruning that should have took place but didn't. Mm. And that's the one I really don't wanna scare you away from because we do need to prune our trees to make sure they have good structure. In fact, a lot of times when storms come through our communities and you notice there's like five or six trees across the community that broke out or whatever, you're like, oh, the storm did that. Eh, it probably wasn't pruned right at some point. You know, it, it's, it's probably a management issue that caused those trees not to, to remain upright during a storm. Now, yes, there are tornadoes and things and even a healthy, great structurally sound tree is gonna break in that. But a lot of that stuff can be avoided with proper pruning. Um, and I'm just looking at the time here. It's about 640. And you said maybe 45 minutes. So um, I'm just going to kind of blast through the pruning section. But I do want you to know that there are wonderful resources out there. Um, again, Angie does have a list. But uh, Iowa State does some really great ones for pruning. Um, we don't have any of our own, but we do have a pruning brochure on the uh, Wisconsin DNR website. Um, and real quick, too, I'm going to see, you probably can't see this, but this is the tree owner's manual. This is put out by the US Forest Service. It's hard to find a paper copy, but of course it's online. Um, excellent resource. It'll talk about how to plant trees, how to pick out stock, how to test the site, um, to see if, you know drainage and things like that. Um, and it also talks about pruning. So real, I'm gonna try to burn through this a little bit so I can actually get to the end of my presentation sure. for you, Angie, on time. Um, but pruning, let's avoid these mistakes. And I apologize because we're going to buzz through here with the pruning because there are a lot of pictures. Um, okay, this one I will take just a second on. And that is, I see a lot of these out there. I call these bunny ear trees. You can see it's got two leaders. This is structurally not sound. These tend to break out in storms very easily because they have that bee crotch in there somewhere. And even at this, even, you know, you plant a tree, you know, you can take one or two snips real quick. Don't do a lot of pruning. It's, right when you're planting a tree, but you know, after it's been in the, in your yard for a couple years, feel free to do some, some pruning, you know, within, with some restraint, you don't want to go crazy, but this is something you can easily take care of. You want your tree, one pruning snip, and there we go. You know, that tree is now going to be set up for the rest of its life 
and avoid that storm damage. Simple as that, one little pruning cut and this tree is so much better off. So don't be afraid to prune your trees. This is a tree that hasn't been pruned. Uh, these are obviously drawings and illustrations, but they're pretty accurate. You know, if, if you don't prune a tree, it's gonna be a mess. It's gonna be a liability for you. If you do prune a tree, and really most of the pruning on this tree happened in those first 10 years. This is stuff you can do as a homeowner. You don't need to hire an arborist necessarily. Just make sure you're doing it right. Um, and then, you know, as the trees get older and in age, you know, yeah, they might still need some pruning here or there, but not nearly as much if you paid attention to them when they were young. Just like kids, right? You pay a lot more attention to them when they're young, give them a lot of love, give them a lot of training. They can grow up to be big adults that can, you know, subsist on their own, hopefully. <laughs> so trees are the same way. All right, this is just a three-step pruning cut. You can find these images anywhere. This is what happens if you don't use a three-step pruning cut. You can have a tear out. These are just, again, how to prune, but we don't have time for that today. Maybe I'll be invited back next year and we can do pruning. How does that sound, Angie? <laughs> sure. All right, when you do a good pruning cut, it looks like this, um, and then it seals over as we go, and you get a nice, uh, nice little donut that seals right up. When you do a flush cut, please do not do flush cuts. Um, you have pruning wounds that look like that. These are stubs. I would rather you leave a stub than flush cut, but stubs are bad too. That can still lead uh, for pockets of rot to get into your tree, but not, not nearly as bad as if you do a flush cut. Um, and then real quick too, don't use pruning paints or pruning tar, um, unless we're uh, dealing with an oak, oak that you're pruning during the oak wilt uh, window. So uh, I believe, depending on where you're at, um, I would say anywhere between April 15th and, um, I don't know, these years, maybe even March 15th um, and October 15th. I mean, that's even bigger than our DNR window, but that way you're sure there's no insects flying um, that, that carry the, um, the, the oak wilt fungus. So, but if you do have to prune during that, during the summer, basically or the growing season for oak, go ahead and use tree paint um, because uh, that will keep those insects from going into it. Otherwise it can promote rot for other trees. Oaks are pretty good at the rot, avoiding rot in general. Okay, moving on. Number three, um, this is a big one and that's poor tree planting. There's a lot that goes into this, um, but the basics that we really need to get here is plant trees, not poles. Make sure the root flare or make sure the root flare is within a few inches of the soil surface. We're talking like one or two inches down, but I want you to have it as close to the surface as possible. Um, it, uh, and our, a friend of mine gave me this one, bear the flare. Make sure we can see it. And down there at the bottom, that's a picture of a root flare. When you go out to the woods, you see trees, their roots are, you know, you can see that flare. We don't see telephone poles in the woods. So let's not plant those that way um, for, for so many reasons. And, and there's a picture down here. I, I just kind of want to point up and look at it. <laughs> I can't do that. But that picture over there with that sort of like weird sort of red triangle thing, mm -hmm. um, that is a tree that was a ball and burlap. So it was wrapped up in the ball and you know, we took off the ball and burlap and we dug down in the soil. And it was, I think in this case, it was 16 inches deep, 16 inches yeah. deep in the soil. And that can be all sorts of bad. Trunk tissue belongs in the air, not underground. It's not designed to be underground and rot, you name it, happen. Your tree's not gonna thrive. It's not gonna be able to do what it needs to do. And bigger issue than that, actually I've got some better pictures is girdling roots. Um, Shoot, we'll, we'll get to them here in a second, but girdling roots, you can see there's a bunch of roots that are wrapped around that. Uh, a lot of our trees, go to any park, look down any street, look in any yard, you will find some girdling roots. Um, in this case, that tree is 100% surrounded by it. Yep, not affecting it now, but give it another 10 years and it'll it's basically choking itself to death. Um, so those are things that we wanna avoid. And, and, and too much mulch can do that too. That's why we don't want mulch against the trunks because that basically turns into soil and then you have a deep tree as well. So. Um, just be careful with that. Love mulch, but you got to be careful. Okay, so the other things to consider when you're planting are space. Clearly the tree in the middle, not such a great thing. Drainage, um, and then soil compaction. If you can't get a shovel in the ground, you know you got a problem. It's compacted. You're going to have to add some organic matter. Um, dig it up, add a bunch of organic matter. That'll help. Um, and there are, in that tree owner's manual, there's a lot of ways to how you test for drainage and things like that. Basically dig a hole, fill it with water, let it drain out, fill it again, and then hopefully overnight, It'll empty. If it hasn't emptied, you probably have a drainage issue. Um, it, because it's so important, I just wanted to show this. Bear the flare. The root flare needs to be the surface wrong. It's too deep. And you're like, why would I ever plant it too deep? I clearly know that because 
most of the time when you buy a containerized tree, most of the time when you buy a bare root tree, I mean, I'm sorry, a ball and burlap tree, it's already deep in the ball. It's already deep in the container. So if you follow the directions and plant it at the level that's in the container, you're going to be deep. You're going to be deep. Something like, uh, there was a stat somewhere I read. I don't know if there's any scientific evidence to back it up, but I'll just say a majority of our trees that we plant, we plant them too deep. Why do some of them survive and don't die? Because they're like silver realms. They are, they, you know, they grew up in the floodplains. They're used to soil changing uh, depth. And so they can put out a new set of roots above the old ones just to adapt. Other trees can't, for example, maple. We don't see a lot of those unless they're in the downtown, beautiful, lush, uh, great soils. Um, so just some things to keep in mind. All right, again, bear the flare. There's a, this is more like the girdling rip that you're gonna see in your neighborhood. I see them all over my neighborhood. Um, can you do something about that? Yeah, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, but they can be removed depending. Um, so just keep those in mind. And this is what you're gonna see, you know, trees die slowly. Okay, they die even after construction damage, it might be eight years before you notice die back in your tree because they die slowly. They store a lot of energy. Um, but this is what you're gonna see, things like this or worse yet, things like this. This one was, I can tell you right now, girdling roots killed this tree, you can tell um, by the way it broke, um, hmm. by the way it popped out of the ground like that. Trees don't do that normally. Um, if they're gonna fall over in, in the forest, they usually have a big root plate that comes with them. All right, um, this is just an example of a containerized, I'll click through it real quick, but this is how you buy them, right? And you measure that, you're gonna dig the hole, but guess what? If you identify where that root flare is, you can remove that much soil, have a much smaller hole that you dig and get this tree at the right height. Had you planted this one right out of the container, it would have been four inches too deep in the ground. And the deeper your tree is in the ground too, the harder it is to get to oxygen. Roots actually need oxygen. And especially in our clay soils, we don't have a lot of oxygen the deeper you go down. So um, your tree might sit there and just not grow as well as it could have just because it's a little bit too deep. All right. Herbicides are a big one too. This kind of comes to the um, couple of things, right? We need to pay attention to volatilization. If you're applying a Roundup when it's 95 degrees out, it's gonna volatilize. You know, it's gonna get up in the air and then hit the foliage that's around it. Trees are just big, broad leaf plants, broad leaf weeds, if you will. So they are affected by all these chemicals as well. Uh, the little birch tree up here with sprouts around it, I got people who you know use Roundup around those trees because they don't want to use the weed whacker and because Brian told me not to use weed whacker, so I used Roundup instead. Well, if it hits those sprouts, also the bark. Um, bark has chlorophyll in it um, and type tissue, just like in the leaves, and it can take some of that product in. So be careful. Granted, it's a tree. It takes a lot more to kill it. However, that's stress and stress can bring other things. All right, number one, um, construction damage. This comes in all shapes and forms. Um, so just real quick, this, you know, real quick, don't build a house on top of your tree root systems, okay? This is a bad idea. <laughs> they don't like it. Um, but these are more common things that you might see. You know, you might need to put a trench or a wire or a conduit to your new garage in your yard. If you trench it, you're cutting tree roots. Just so you know, most tree roots are in the top 18 inches of soil. In fact, half of the roots are in the top six inches of soil. So bore underneath them, don't cut them. We've got a lot of technology to do that these days. Don't hurt your trees. They are worth so much more. Um, this is the other thing too, when people are doing construction damage or even in their yard, they, I see it all the time. They set their landscaping pallet of rocks right on top of their, right next to their tree. Cause that's where the shade is. You know, that's where they wanna go and get the stuff. They don't wanna get too hot. Well, that can compact and hurt and ruin the soil underneath the tree, causing it not to be able to get the oxygen it needs. And eventually it dies out after a couple of years. So avoid that. Um, and this is the one that I, I, they're like, this isn't construction. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. They constructed a planter around their tree. And now this tree that might've been perfectly planted is a foot too deep in the ground. And we talked about why that's a bad thing. So avoid putting these things around your trees. All right, so just a summary re uh, real quick here, plant the right tree for the space. Okay? Don't plant too big of a tree because that's gonna cause problems, maintenance issues, et cetera. Um, if it's not the right tree in the right space, you know, if it needs good drainage and you put it in that place that's not draining very well, gonna cause stress, gonna cost you more money, gonna be more of a liability. You want these trees to be successful. If you put a tree where it wants to be, you can almost set it and forget it. Just make sure you're training you're doing training pruning. But other than that, you're not gonna have to spray it. You're not gonna have to deal with pruning, you know, too much pruning. It's gonna take care of itself for the most part, but make sure you water your trees. 
Um, if we're in a droughty situation, we are not getting drought, even your big trees are gonna need some water. Most trees need at least an inch of water um, per week. Um, and if you have a newly planted tree, that's about a five gallon pail per diameter inch of your tree. So if you, most people plant about a two inch tree. So that's about 10 gallons of water, eight to 10 gallons of water a week that that's gonna need. Uh, make sure you mulch your trees. We already talked about the great benefits. Prune your trees. Okay, that's that whole training pruning is such a great thing to do and protect your trees. Just make sure you remove the protection. Um, here's a picture of that. This was just paper craft wrap that was on the tree, um, left on there too long. It didn't break down, but that tree started to get girdled. Okay, this homeowner found it, I guess, quote unquote, in time, so that tree didn't die, but boy, it sure left. It could have very easily. Um, so don't leave your staking on, don't leave your, you know, a rabbit protection on that comes off during the summer. Don't leave it on all year round. Okay, um, when to call an expert? Hazard trees. Whenever you have a storm, um, those are very dangerous situations. Um, cracks, splits, etc. cetera. Um, most removals are gonna need an expert. Um, we don't want any houses or cars or people getting damaged. Um, things to be aware of, canopy changes. So like color, wilt, leaf loss. Uh, there's a lot of leaf loss really recently. You know, call your extension agent. They can tell you it's anthracnose or petiole borer, not a big deal. A lot of leaf things aren't a big deal, but when you have early color coloration, like fall color starting in September, when it normally shouldn't start, all the rest of the trees in your yard aren't starting until, of the same species aren't starting until October, you probably have a root issue um, and that could need professional care. Um, wilts are a little different. If your oak's losing leaves in summer um, and they look like the ones in this picture, that's oak wilt and that could be a big day, big issue. Anytime you feel you need to leave the ground, like this guy in the picture over here on the ladder, probably you need a professional. <laughs> okay. The last thing you wanna do is take a sharp impl implement or a chainsaw up a ladder. It just doesn't mix well, okay? So anytime you leave the ground. Um, anytime before major construction on your, on your home site. So if you're gonna be putting in a driveway, um, a new addition or building a new home, uh, you can do there, this, this, this orange fence down here. You know, you can have a professional come in and tell you how you can preserve the trees on your site. Again, a lot of people are like, oh, I put a driveway in 10, you know, like five years ago, no problem. It was right next to my tree. Well, yeah, trees take a long time to die. It might be, you know, 10 or 12 years before that tree's gone. But putting a, you know, wiping out half the root system on a mature tree, it's going to have consequences. And then, of course, anytime you're uncomfortable, if you feel like I shouldn't be doing this, then yeah, call an expert. Um, and then we just, as far as careers, real quick, um, there's a ton of careers in the field of urban forestry. Um, and both men and women, uh, in fact, the lady up here climbing the tree in, in, the, in the center picture, she's a uh, world ladies climbing champion. So, um, you name it, there's opportunities out there for what you want to do. If you don't want to climb trees, you can do, you know, small or shrub uh, pruning, you can do plant health care, you can do research. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff out there. You like to operate equipment, you know, there's that crane uh, doing a removal there. Plenty of opportunities out there. And the cool thing in Wisconsin, we've got so many ways for people to get into this career. Um, one of the newest and that I'm pretty excited about is we have apprenticeships. So if you're an adult looking to switch careers, you know, and you want to apprentice in this, you can do that. Um, there's youth apprenticeship programs that are starting this summer. It's, it's a new rollout um, for high school juniors and seniors. Um, on the job training is traditionally how people got trained into this. We have a wonderful one and two year programs out there as well. Um, so for, for Milton, I don't think Janesville has a program anymore, but um, Madison area uh, technical college or Madison college now, um, they have a one-year diploma and a two-year um, associate's degree in urban forestry, and they work around your schedule. A lot of the students in that program work during the day um, for arboriculture firms and then go to school um, in the evenings or like one day a week for the full day. Um, so pretty cool ways to do that. And then, of course, there are four-year universities so that you can get um, more education to have uh, some of these different careers that are out there. So plenty of opportunities right here in Wisconsin. All right. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? And then this is my contact information. If you um, would like that resource list um, that I kept referring to, I can definitely send that to you or Angie can um, just send me an email. Um, yeah, there you go, Angie. Instead of okay. 45, it was 55. <laughs> yeah, you did pretty good. Um, I do have one question and maybe it's too broad of a question, but yes. we are working, the library is working to build a story garden. So we have like, I think it's about an acre space to make into a garden. And um, just wondering, is there a type of tree that's good for a smaller garden space that 
won't get too big, but will still provide shade or we're debating what types of trees to plant because we had to cut down. We had a lot of ash trees, unfortunately, that sure. we had to remove. And so now we have a lot of. Space. Yeah, you know, it, that's kind of a fun question in a, in a way. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is a lot of we do have there's a lot of small stature trees out there. Um, and the one that I really like that might work well for you would be something like um, a service berry, also known as a June berry. Um, and, okay. you know, they have beautiful fall foliage. They'll also produce edible berries, um, but mostly the birds get them before you do. Um, sure. So yeah, it's it's a great little tree. It's, you know, a nice alternative to say, uh, you know, some sort of flowering crab, but you know, those aren't bad. There's just a lot of them out there. Um, if you can find a, there are thornless hawthorns, great, but don't plant a thorned one. Um, okay. Especially if you're having kids that are gonna be near it. Yes. Right, so you don't wanna have to deal with that. Um, but thinking about it, maybe a hawthorn would be kind of cool. Again, a thornless variety because there are more hawthorns, I think, in some of the area. I could be wrong because that's where it ties in your, you know, your story garden. Sure. But there's a lot of great little trees that are out there. Um, and there's more than that, I just at the top of my head. Hmm. Oh, no, that's fine. I understand. But, that's but again, you want to check the drainage. You want to dig a hole there and see what you have for compaction and other stuff. And then, um, you know, do the best you can to like add organic matter to it, not fertilizer, uh, but organic matter to the soil because that just helps sure. the structure and really helps those trees. Are there- When I'm in Milton, I can come over there and take a look. Okay. Are there trees that we should avoid? Like, I don't know. Like my husband always says that willow trees um, suck up sand. I don't know if that's a true statement. Suck up sand, huh. <laughs> I don't know. Interesting. Um, they do well. Interesting, because like you know, things like ironwood and uh, and willow, I believe that might be true as well. But they just they bring up a lot of minerals, and so their old wives tell that they suck up sand, but really they they store minerals within their in their tissue. Um, and okay. so if you you know they'll dull your saw, you know they'll dull a chainsaw. Loggers complain about them all the time because of all those minerals. They're not actually sucking up the sand, but sure. they are getting a lot of minerals in there. Um, so bad trees. Um. Well, you're asking me and I am a tree aficionado and so I'm gonna say there are no bad trees. Yeah. Um, they're just trees that are put in the wrong spots, right? Sure. Cause you're not gonna want a black walnut next to a place where you're gonna want a garden. No. Um, you're not gonna want it over your driveway either cause you don't want walnuts clonking on your car and putting dents in it. Um, you know, sure. box elder, uh, a colleague of mine once said they're a crap tree. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, they're great trees, but in the right spot, right? I mean, they provide a lot of wildlife habitat. You may not want one next to your house. You know, they tend to be a little bit more weak wooded. I've seen some that are over 150 years old and they're super cool. Yeah. But um, again, you know, box elder bugs, um, weak wooded, things like that. So keep them away from your house. Uh, same with willows. I think willows are great next to a pond or something far away from your house, but they tend to get really big. They tend to be weak wooded again. So um, sure. bad trees, no, trees in the wrong space. Yes. Yeah. Like a dogwood. Oh. Well, do those get the little white? The dogwoods are great. The little white uh, flowers or seeds, or is that the cottonwood? Something like. It, oh yeah, so, so cottonwood will get those the fluff. Yes. The fluffy, They're nasty things really that people cool. totally hate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So those that'd be a cottonwood. So right again, um, not a bad tree, just in the wrong spot. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned dogwoods again, great for a small space. Uh, there's a lot of really cool dogwoods out there. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, shoot. Hmm. Darn. Oh, well. well. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Oh, yes. No, I got it. I oh, got okay. it. Thank you. So trees, bad, not bad trees, but just ones that are in the wrong spot, right? Yep. For example, everybody likes Colorado. Well, not everybody. A lot of people like Colorado blue spruce. Mm -hmm. or as we like to call them around here, blue spruce. Well, Colorado is part of their name because that's where they're from. If we think about Colorado, it's deserts and mountains. One thing Colorado doesn't have is a lot of humidity. What does Wisconsin have a lot of? <laughs> humidity, all right? So here's a, they're great. Colorado blue spruce are great in Colorado. They are crummy here in Wisconsin. Um, you know, people plant them because they have that beautiful bluish green color, mm -hmm. but the humidity is going, you're, you're going to get Cytospora or Rhizosphere and you're going to lose all your needles. You, you look at it around town, as soon as they hit about, it, 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 even earlier, like about 15, 20 years of age, they start to, to get it and they start to lose their needles and eventually they're 
are completely horrible and junk right when they're about the size when they could be providing all those great benefits for you. So what do you do? Don't plant a Colorado blue spruce, plant a white fir. Right. Same color from a distance, it looks identical, um, but it's not gonna have those same issues. Cool. Okay. Anything else? I don't have anything else. <laughs> it was very right. informative. Um, good, good. Um, Ryan, did you have any questions? You can throw them in the chat or? He says, thank All you. Right. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for taking your time to listen to this. I hope you got something out of it. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah. And we'll put the recording up um, as soon as we have it ready and internet access. <laughs> Um, All right. Sounds good. But have a great night and thank you again.